Hello, I'm Steve from Mac84, and we're going to be talking about iMac G3s today. Why? Well, I saw this little video that Alex put out from the Short Circuit YouTube channel. And, you know, I'm not, usually not one to nitpick here, but he did a video about the iMac G3. It was called The Computer of the 2000s Apple iMac G3. And I'll put a link up here or a link in the video description so you can check that out for yourself. It's not a bad video. However, it sort of irks me because there's a lot of incorrect facts in that video, things that are just not true. So we're going to go over a few of them and sort of correct and educate because that's what this channel is all about. Look, I make mistakes all the time. I am not perfect by any means, but uh, let's sort of correct some of the things that we may have misheard or misunderstood about the iMac and take a better look at why it was such a popular machine in the early 2000s. Okay, so where do we begin by helping our good friend Alex here? Well, right from the start, Alex claimed that his iMac G3 model at 400 megahertz was the fastest model they made. The iMac that Alex was showing off was actually a, a low-end model. So the iMac slot load models, like this one here, came in a variety of tiers. You know, you, the, Apple usually had your good, better, best model. And the model he had was a low-end 400 megahertz model that was actually a rehash of the one previous to that. So it was only 400 megahertz. It only had eight megabytes of video memory. It wasn't the fastest machine out there, but you know what? That was your budget model. And if you couldn't afford what Apple wanted for a mid tier or anything like that, that's what you got, simple as that. So although that particular machine only had a 400 megahertz G3 PowerPC processor inside, other models in the iMac line actually had a 500 megahertz and all the way up to a 600 megahertz G3 processor. Not too bad for 2001. Number two, the IO. Alex says, We've got the I.O. For the time on a PC, this was considered pretty bad. Now, I disagree with Alex here. The I.O. for early 2000s on this model? Ain't too bad. Remember, this is a budget machine. It wasn't a creative powerhouse. It wasn't a Power Mac desktop or anything. This was a machine that your home or your school or something like that would have purchased as like their first time computer or a spare computer or maybe their only computer. These machines were pretty quick and you know the I.O. wasn't too limiting. Today, maybe we think, oh wow, it doesn't have USB 3 or gigabit ethernet. What? You know what, back in 2001, you didn't really need that stuff. Now these machines have two USB 1.1 ports and yes, that is a little bit limited, especially since you plug the keyboard in, but the keyboard also has two USB ports on it. So you had a port on the left or the right for your mouse, you could choose whatever one you wanted. Uh, and then you could just buy a USB hub. Under hundred bucks, you got a four port USB hub. I think they were even cheaper than that by the time uh, these iMacs were around. Don't forget, most PCs of this era only had one or maybe two USB ports. So knocking the iMac for only having two is just silly. If you needed a little bit more speed, you had Firewire. Firewire was one of the ports Apple loved to put on their machines. It was up to 400 megabits per second. It was actually faster than USB 2.0 in actual practical use because USB 2.0 relied on the CPU for a lot of the stuff that was going on to make it work. Whereas Firewire didn't. It was just really, really quick and it was great for digital video, using on a camcorder, external hard drives, even scanners, stuff like that. So the argument that the IO was lacking, I don't really buy it. I mean, you had a lot of accessories that you could buy that used USB and Firewire. Don't get me wrong, would have been great to have a PCI card slot in there or an AGP card slot or something like that. But again, this was not the design of this computer. It was not designed to be that expandable. USB gave you a lot of flexibility, especially for well, using a USB floppy drive. Yeah, you could just buy a USB floppy drive. They're about $100, $150 if you didn't get one on sale. But these external floppy drives worked perfectly fine. Alex says floppy disks were still quite popular in 1999. So it was pretty radical that they only included a CD drive here. I think Alex is confused and must have been thinking of the reaction to the original 1998 iMac. But by 2001, it was accepted that Apple just didn't have floppy drives with their iMacs, or any of their computers for that matter. But if you got the good or better model iMac, they already had a CD burner built right in. So if you didn't have to use a floppy drive, you could use an external hard drive. Uh, if you were really on the cutting edge, you could buy an external CD burner, use your Firewire port for that. I mean, yeah, if you had a PC or you had another computer and you had to transfer files, you could go out and buy one of these USB floppy drives. And a lot of the companies that were selling these computers, they would give you a bundle or they would give you a discounted price on one of these when you purchase the computer. So yeah, it was inconvenient, but most people that needed one, they just bit the bullet, bought the floppy drive, and that was that. 
And if you wanted something a bit more modern than a USB floppy drive, well, I go into this a bit more in detail on my iMac video where I talk about the legacy Macintosh I.O. ports and the USB revolution because, well, there's a lot of cool things you could get, like a USB zip drive, or you could get a iMation Super Drive, which could actually read regular floppy disks and 120 megabyte super floppy. So even if you didn't have a USB floppy drive, there were other options available to you, and not including one with the computer, yeah, it was a bit of a pain, I guess, if you need to use stuff like this, but I guess Apple was considering, hey, you got the USB ports there, why don't you buy one of the storage mediums that you want to use, and you could use that. If you didn't want to use SneakerNet, Ethernet networking was another alternative for sharing files. These iMacs also had an optional add-on slot to accept an airport Wi-Fi card as well. Don't forget, USB flash drives weren't really out then, so it was a few years until those would become popular. Number three, Mac OS X running like hot garbage. All right, let's, let's evaluate things here. So the machine shipped with 64 megabytes of RAM. I would not suggest running any version of Mac OS X with 64 megabytes of RAM, period. However, you show the machine, it actually has 768 megabytes of RAM, so it was upgraded. Mac OS X shouldn't have a problem running on that machine, especially the version you have there, Mac OS X.2 Jaguar. That's pretty comfortable even with 128 or 256 megabytes of memory. So my guess is something else is going on there. It looks like you have some HP pop-ups that are bugging you there, so there's probably some bloat there that you could trim away. There's also probably a lot of older applications and stuff like that. Also, the original hard drive is probably... Wait a second, didn't you say the computer was kicked off of a table? Well, yeah, no wonder it's probably running a bit slow. Eep. That poor hard drive is probably very, very unhappy. So my bigger concern here would be the hard drive. Even if that hard drive didn't take a long walk off of a short pier, those hard drives ran very hot. There wasn't a lot of airflow in these iMacs, so I could totally see that hard drive slowing down and dying in its old age, causing the Mac OS operating system to feel very sluggish. Now, of course, Mac OS 9 screams on these machines, so most versions of Mac OS 10 can't even compete. However, with that amount of memory, I think you'll be okay running Mac OS 10 as long as you don't try and put something silly like Leopard on it, and you're running applications that were designed for it. Nothing too crazy. Number four, why are you running the Mac OS 9 version of iMovie there? You realize you're running the Mac OS 9 version of the application, right? Right above that folder, right there, there's an applications folder for Mac OS X. These are Mac OS X native applications and were designed for the operating system. I don't know anybody who would want to run the iMovie version that was not for Mac OS X but for Mac OS 9 while they were in OS X. Just starting that Mac OS 9 classic environment takes up a whole lot of memory and there's just a lot of translation that goes on there, so why bother doing that? Use the native version of iMovie for Mac OS X and you'll be fine. That software shipped with those machines and it should run beautifully, even with a lot of DV footage, as long as you got enough hard drive space and enough memory. Number five, you claim that the hard drive inside of the iMac is SCSI. Well, that's sort of inaccurate. So here's a 2001 iMac logic board. You'll see there's a little port here. This one port drives two devices, the hard drive and your optical disk drive. Now that optical disk drive could be a CD reader or a DVD reader, etc. But this port is a little special. This is not an IDE port. It's not a SCSI port either. This is actually an ATAPI port. This port has a special breakout cable. The left side of the cable here connects to the logic board. Then the right side goes to your standard ATA hard drive. But the middle part of the cable, that connects to your optical disk drive. What's cool about that is it actually sends power to the optical disk drive. Whereas the hard drive gets its power via a standard Molex connector. So that explains a little mystery behind this port. ATAPI can actually send SCSI commands and responses through the ATA bus. So there's a little bit more to this port than just calling it a SCSI port, and that hard drive is definitely not a SCSI hard drive. Number six, Alex, you claim that these iMac G3s were the last generation of PowerPC processors, and that within one or two years after these models were released, that Apple switched to Intel chips. That is simply not true. There's a lot of things that we have to talk about here. All right, first off, these iMacs run on G3 processors, but after these were released in 2002, iMacs came with G4 processors. And after those, iMacs came with G5 processors. And of course, Apple didn't just sell the iMac. They sold iBooks like these. They sold PowerBooks. They sold Mac Towers. Uh, they sold a lot of products. These were not the end of the line of the PowerPC processor. 
at all. These iMacs sold from May 1998 until January 2002 when the iMac G3 models were discontinued and replaced with iMac G4s. Now, to say that the Intel Switch came right after these, one or two years after, that's just incorrect, man. <laughs> so these models were discontinued in 2002, but the iMac G4 followed after that, and it wasn't until WWDC in June of 2005 that Apple announced they were switching to Intel processors. That switch didn't complete until sometime in 2006. So that's a few years gap between your early 2001 iMac that you have in your video and the first Intel models that came out. So that's a bit of a gap there. And so I just want to correct you on that one. There's, there's a lot of PowerPC machines that were used from 2001 to 2005. And some of them are great machines with multiple processors and awesome stuff you could do with them. So don't discount the PowerPC. It's a pretty good chip. Let's not forget that when the dual 2 GHz processor G5 Tower was released in 2003, it had a 64-bit processor and was one of the fastest consumer-level computers out there. This was still two and a half years away from the first Intel Mac. So when you keep complaining that the processor is not an x86 chip, well, that really doesn't matter. Number 7. You claim that the iMac G3 speakers were just as good as the MacBook Air speakers. Now, Look, I don't have a new MacBook Air, I can't afford one, but I would wager that these iMac speakers have much more bass and sound much better than a MacBook Air, and they could definitely fill a living room. Have you heard these things on max volume? Yeah, they're not too bad. Now, they're not the best. However, Harman Kardon designed the speakers in these things. They're pretty good, unless you have one that has rotted out speakers or something like that. I don't know. Maybe your ears are better than mine, but in my opinion, these speakers ain't too shabby. Number eight, you claim that the ATI Rage graphics were not really supported that well on the Mac OS. Well, let's back a bit up here. First off, these machines shipped with Mac OS 9. So although you can run Mac OS 10, and some of them actually included Mac OS 10 pre-installed, Mac OS 9 was what these machines were originally designed to run. The architecture had not changed that much over the years when this model was introduced in 1998. They always used ATI Rage graphics, and from the revision B model of the first iMac from 1998, they all used 128 graphics chipsets. So the ATI Rage card was pretty much well supported on the Mac OS. However, yes, it wasn't the best card, and your iMac is one of the lower end models, so you have your good, better, and best. Well, your good model only had eight megabytes of video memory, and the better and best models had 16 megabytes of video memory. So that extra eight megabytes of video memory was better for loading textures and maps and stuff like that. So yeah, you could get by using the eight megabytes of your iMac and you could play The Sims or Unreal Tournament and you just had to lower the settings a little bit, but it didn't run too bad. Now, of course, if you had the better or the best model of these iMacs, it came with 16 megabytes of video memory. It was double the video memory, so you had more space for textures and all this stuff that you could load up on your machine. You could also run games at a higher resolution because the CPU wasn't trying to do stuff as much. The graphics processor was able to do its job. Now, you could run Unreal Tournament and The Sims and other classic games like that at a respectable resolution with respectable frame rates. Just don't jack up the settings to a crazy amount. Again, these are not gaming PCs. These were educational models. These were my first computer models. These were productivity models. If you wanted a high powered, fast gaming Mac, you bought a Power Mac Tower. You didn't buy an iMac. Now, Mac OS X, especially the version you have there, Mac OS 10.2 Jaguar, had Quartz Extreme, which was a graphics acceleration engine. But yeah, the ATI Rage really wasn't 100% supported on that. So you wouldn't have too much acceleration with the GUI and everything. And yeah, it could be a bit sluggish, especially because Mac OS X takes up extra memory. Again, I think that probably your issue there is the hard drive is being a little slow and it's probably on its last legs. If you installed Mac OS X on a new hard drive, even a solid state drive, and you put some games on there at a respectable resolution, I don't think you'd have much of a problem. Number nine, that VGA port on the back is actually very, very handy. One of the top requests that Apple got from people who were using the iMac in schools and educational institutions was that they wanted to export the video and present on a big TV or a projector. And you couldn't do that because the iMacs did not have VGA out or any way to connect a video monitor to it. That's until the iMac DV or iMac slot load models. 
Most of those, especially in the later end of the life, had VGA ports right on the back of it. So you just plug in a monitor or a projector and boom, you can mirror your screen. So it wasn't uncommon, especially at schools, to see an iMac set up and the teacher's iMac would be set up there and it would be linked to a projector or a TV. It was a really handy feature. And especially these days with these CRTs maybe being flaky from their flyback transformers or just old age, it's great to have that VGA video out built right into the computer. Number 10, you talk about optical drives in these iMac G3s. Yes, the early models did have tray loading drives. You push the little button and the disc tray comes out. The later models, like the one you have from early 2001, does have an optical drive that is actually a slot load mechanism, sort of like the CD players on your cars, or at least when cars had CD players. I'm sure Apple would have loved to have the slot load one from the beginning, but that just wasn't in the cards. I would argue that probably a greater drive for this change was schools. Inside schools, you have plenty of kids. What do kids like to do? They like to fiddle with things and they like to break things. Here's an optical disk drive from one of those earlier iMacs there. Now you push this button, the tray comes out. The problem with that is, ooh, it's a shiny colorful button, let's push it. Ooh, the tray comes out, let's push it back in. Oh, that was fun, let's do it again. Oh, the bezel came off. Let's try it really, really hard to eject this disk without pushing that button there, especially when the button isn't there anymore. So yeah, that was a problem. So switching to the slot loading optical disk drives was probably a great idea on Apple's part. Now, Alex, you seemed a little concerned about getting your CD out of that slot loading disk drive. Now, you were probably just playing a bit to the camera. However, there is a little bit of a concern there. These optical drives are almost 20 years old now, and they actually rely on a rubber belt to eject that CD. Without that belt working as effectively as it used to, that CD may not come out, or it may come out very, very slowly, and you might need to coax it out a little bit. However, there is a solution to that. First off, if the machine won't eject, well, just keep trying. You actually don't even need an operating system installed to eject the disk on these iMacs. Did you know that? Because this actually goes back to the very first Macintosh computer in 1984. In fact, on every Macintosh computer, if you have a mouse plugged into the machine and you hold down the mouse button as soon as you push that power button, that disk is gonna eject, whether it's a floppy disk or a CD drive. So that's a good little tip to use. Now, you might have to press eject again and again and again to get that disk out, especially if that little belt there has been worn and seen better days, but it will eventually come out. Also, on most of these iMacs on that CD drive, even if it's a slot load drive, you'll have a place where you can put in a paper clip and touch a little eject mechanism. Similar to the little holes on floppy disk drives where you could put a paper clip in and manually eject the floppy disk. Where in these scenarios, it's usually just a little button and that button just forces the eject mechanism to turn on and actually try and eject the disk. You can see that here on these iMacs, there's a little visible hole, but on these slot loading models here, it's usually to the very far right or the far left. I believe it's on the right though. Number 11. So that CRT is actually probably not gonna hurt you, well, as long as you discharge it properly. You do know how to properly discharge a CRT, don't you? Well, I hope you do. If not, my friend Bruce from Rikus Creations has an awesome video on discharging CRTs from old Macs. Of course, the video that he has shows it in a much older Mac, but the principles are the same. All you wanna do is discharge that CRT, and then you can safely work around in the iMac without worrying about anything. Sure, you don't wanna to touch those capacitors, that's never a good idea, but you should be comfortable touching the computer without touching the CRT if it's not discharged, or discharge the CRT, then you don't have to worry about anything. So Alex, I hope you didn't mind the corrections here. I'm just trying to share some knowledge about these iMacs that you may have misrepresented. Look, we all make mistakes, but the whole point of me doing videos is to educate people about these lovely machines and about what they can do and about the history of them. If you misrepresent those facts, well, it doesn't really do you much credit and it causes a lot of confusion and that just spreads. So let's all agree that that is probably a bad thing to do. I realize your production values are much higher than mine and you probably have a much tighter time frame to get these videos out in and that maybe you're just talking about this computer that you had off the top of your head and you didn't even look up any facts. That's fine, but you should maybe put that in the video description, maybe below that promotion link you have there. <laughs> now, I understand you have 696,000 more subscribers than my little Mac 84 channel does, but you know what? Let's all try and represent the facts of these computers and let's not try and change history. 
So if you're like me and you like to learn about these machines and know the accurate history behind them, well, be sure to check out my channel, Mac84. There's that little subscribe button down there. I would appreciate it if you hit that. Make sure you hit the little bell icon. That'll notify you when I do a live stream or when I release a new video. You can also follow me on Instagram or Twitter. My handle is Mac84TV. And if you want to, you could support me on Patreon to help these videos keep on coming. For only a dollar a month, you get instant access to a backlog of my behind the scenes videos, and you get exclusive content you just can't get anywhere else. Plus, with new videos, you get to see them before anybody on YouTube does. So that's it for now. After all, we're all here to have fun. And Alex, you did a pretty good video. So take care, guys. I'm Steve from Mac84, and I'll see you next time.